Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second of our four seminars uh, hosted by Health Education England and the World Health Organization, uh, which explore the importance of systemic workforce planning for strengthening the global health workforce. As uh, part of the International Year of the Healthcare Worker, as the service and sacrifice of millions of health and care workers will testify, the urgent need to invest in the global health workforce has never been more important. In terms of health, in terms of jobs, in terms of economic opportunity, and in terms of equity and equality. These four seminars hosted by AGE and the WHO discuss what systemic workforce planning is and how systemic workforce planning may be applied to develop workable and economically viable solutions to strengthen the global health workforce. We have been joined today by a quite exceptional group of colleagues from seven countries who are participating in a series of action learning sets being managed by Health Education England and the World Health Organization together with our academic partners, the University of Salford in the UK. They are currently two sessions in in the program and are doing very well. These action learning sets aim to create lasting and strong communities of practice who can learn from each other and support capability and capacity. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, workforce planning capability and capacity are both key in ensuring future sustainability of health services. And so cooperation and collaboration with each other will go hand in hand. Our first seminar occurred back in December 2021 and it was an introduction to workforce planning, which touched on uh, areas where systemic workforce uh, planning existed at the moment and its contribution to strengthening healthcare systems. We had the pleasure to be joined by Jim Campbell from the World Health Organization, Naveena Evans, my boss and the Chief Executive of Health Education England, Rob Smith, the Director of Workforce Planning and Intelligence at Health Education England, and we had approximately 400 people attend the seminar. This second session goes much more into the praxis, with the session focusing on the challenge of responding to shocks in health workforce planning. We know COVID-19 is the current clear and present danger, but even before COVID, we knew there were a wide range of issues health workforce systems needed to respond to. <clears throat> Aging workforces and populations, the emergence of reach and technologies, changing public expectations, and one other issues. As we come out, hopefully, the worst of the pandemic and we head towards recovery, this meeting is what, being recorded. what lessons have we learned and how have we managed simultaneously the pressure of COVID uh, as a, uh, a global pandemic? And other pressures will be. Uh, in, uh, important in how we manage the future of our health systems. During this session, we would invite you to reflect on how you and your colleagues may have responded to the shocks of COVID-19 and other challenges. And we encourage you to put questions forward in our question and answer session later. We have five speakers today, and each speaker will try to stimulate discussion by posing one question at the end of their presentation. This question is meant to make us reflect on a specific topic and start a debate amongst ourselves. Please use the chat section of Zoom to share your views on the question. Please also feel free to ask your own questions to the speakers, which we will do our best to address in the question and answer session later. Please ask all your questions to the speakers in the question and answer field of Zoom. We really do have a great audience today with over 350 people registering for the meeting. And a reminder to our international colleagues, the seminar is being instantaneously translated into Russian. So if you would prefer to listen to us in Russian, please select that as your preferred language. We are also recording this session and the recording will be made available with yourselves in the next few days. I am now delighted to introduce Professor James Buchan, who is a senior visiting fellow at the Health Foundation, as well as affiliated 
to the WHO Collaborating Centre at the University of Technology, uh, Sydney in Australia. He is well known to all of us, uh, both through the written word and through his many uh, presentations, and he has 30 years of experience in health workforce policy and planning, and is also the editor-in-chief of the journal Human Resources for Health. Without further ado, I will hand off to our first speaker, Professor James Buchan. Many thanks. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. My role today really is to set the scene. Um, I have about 10 minutes just to really paint the backdrop for some of the more focused presentations that will come after me. And if you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, just in terms of what I will go through, uh, firstly, just flag some of the critical workforce challenges, picking up on the point that Jed has already made that we have a big shock at the moment through COVID, but we've experienced previous economic and political shocks globally or locally and those impact on the health workforce. Uh, secondly, briefly look at some of the immediate workforce responses to COVID. And thirdly, just give some examples of, of trends and things that are changing. And finally, probably most importantly, a couple of slides on what I regard as the key health workforce policy and planning responses, partly in relation to COVID, but also more importantly, looking ahead and being better prepared for the next shock. Next slide, please. So um, without dropping down into detail, what are the, the key challenges? I've um, at various times worked in about 50 or 60 countries and virtually all countries have these challenges. They may be more or less pronounced um, and the mix may, may differ, but if you talk to a health minister in any country, you will hear a discussion about how do we improve supply into the health workforce, particularly as in a response to demographic change. And we have seen obviously the um, very rapid demand increases made by COVID. And I'll come back to those in the latest slide. As well as supply, there's a recognition that usually the health workforce and, and care workforce are not well distributed by sector, by region, um, and often there are underserved communities. So how do we improve distribution? Thirdly, um, what is the best mix within the workforce to optimize the delivery of patient care and improve population health? And what do we mean by workforce? In many countries, this is extending into looking at community health workers and volunteers. So it's a very broad and inclusive de definition that is required. Fourthly, we talk about workforce planning, but what do we actually mean? And workforce planning means different things in different scenarios, different countries. Do we have funding for the workforce and therefore is planning about looking at where we can allocate funding? Is it more about looking 10 or 20 years ahead in terms of demographic change and what that means for a workforce profile? Different planning questions need different approaches to planning. Last but one point, um, everyone talks about it. We need integration across education, regulation and employment in order to ensure that we have a workforce that's fit for purpose to deliver UHC, but every country is short of perfect alignment or even integration. So how do we move and get those different responsibilities better aligned and ideally integrated? And finally, not forgetting that uh, there's no health without a workforce. There's no workforce without funding. Uh, health is labor intensive. We need to look at funding allocation into the health sector and care sector to ensure employment. Next slide, please. So um, the most recent and most pronounced global impact in terms of a state of shock clearly has been COVID. And uh, these are just um, the main types of surge response that I'm aware many countries have been uh, trying. Many countries have been using all of these. I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but just to recognize that primarily it is about trying to improve the contribution of the current workforce, plus bring back into active employment those who are 
immediately available. They're either retired or on leave, or they're still students, or they have recently arrived in the country or are about to arrive in the country. So the focus inevitably in the early phases of any shock is to look at how you can respond quickly with what you have available. And that's why the surge response really primarily is focused on accessing and making the best use of the available workers. And I have to say that has often been at the expense of worker health and well-being. And that's an issue that we need to consider very carefully in terms of longer term responses. Next slide, please. So uh, just two or three slides to pick up on some of the, the global trends and variations. This is um, a slide that uh, colleagues at the Health Foundation have prepared based on OECD data. And what we have there is a matrix on the, the um, horizontal line, numbers of physicians per thousand population, and on the vertical line, numbers of nurses per thousand population. So immediately what we get there in terms of high income countries of OECD is a sense of, at a very high level, the mix between doctors and nurses and the availability of doctors and nurses. And you can see quite considerable variation, even within the relatively high middle income countries of OECD, significant variation. And this is an issue which speaks to preparedness. Uh, some countries such as the UK, my own country, relatively low in comparison to others, also relatively low bed numbers available, meant that we did not have as much flexibility in the early phases of COVID in terms of response or changing the allocation of workers. We did not have uh, much capacity to move around. We had to build up that capacity quickly. So a key message there about preparedness for any future shocks. Next slide, please. Um, another key message, um, self-sufficiency, uh, ability to replace or replenish the workforce. Uh, this data just shows the number of nurse graduates per 100,000 population, again, in a range of high income countries. And I've presented the data here just because uh, there is a, clearly an issue uh, where some countries, high income countries are using very high level active international recruitment to fill shortfalls in their domestic supply. And this graph shows in one reason why. Uh, across OECD countries, there is um, more than a threefold difference in terms of how many new nurse graduates are coming into the workforce from domestic education. Australia, it's more than 100. My own country of the UK, it's about 30. And as you can see, there's a significant pattern of variation. So different levels of ability to replenish or expand the workforce if you're relying on domestic training capacity. Again, that speaks to issues of preparedness and what policy options are realistic. Next slide, please. Uh, and just to pick up on the issue of international recruitment, uh, this is uh, my own country, UK. I've been monitoring trends in the number of nurses coming into the UK across the period since 1990. Uh, what we can see is very rapid ebbs and flows there. But in recent years, uh, with the exception of a slight drop in 2020 when COVID first hit, uh, we're now reaching a situation where it um, is likely, and I think will be the case, that uh, this current year will be a, a record in terms of the overall number of new nurses registered to practice in the UK coming from other countries. There's also a split there you can see between con uh, EU countries, which is the pale blue, uh, and red, which is um, non-EU countries. You'll be aware, some of you at least, that UK left uh, through Brexit, the EU, um, in a couple of years ago. And as you can see, that has... Um, driven a change in where the UK has been recruiting its nurses from. Uh, next slide, please. So I've just got two slides left. It's a very quick run through, but I'm really just trying to reinforce pre preparedness, um, ability to respond, to be flexible. And part of that is about having sufficient workers available with the right skills and not having to rely 
on training more because there's inevitably a delay if you have to do that. So some key response issues to consider. The, the, the readiness and responsiveness uh, in part is about countries' abilities to enable change, enable rapid change. Does regulation and legislation encourage that to happen or does it block it? Uh, if it blocks it, we need to look at changing regulation and legislation. Secondly, uh, do we have the evidence? One of the issues that come through very clearly with the impact of COVID is the ability to use data rapidly in order to inform action. One example is having uh, as much as possible live information on staff absence rates in different hospitals and different primary care units in order to be able to target deployment of um, additional staff to cover those who are absent. Third point, communications, the ability to keep the workforce well informed about what's happening. But that's not always happened in all countries during COVID and it creates a situation where they are often disconnected from the system they're working for. Uh, a very obvious one, the use of technology, we are uh, increasingly talking about various forms of digi to support the workforce. Uh, a key message there is it's not just about service support, it's also about education delivery, but across that whole continuum, it must be about enabling the worker to be more efficient. Um, and that in part is about training the worker to use the technology. Looking at respite time, downtime, uh, less intense work for periods for those who are burnt out, there is huge, significant problem of burnout of frontline workers across the whole globe. And uh, we fail to address that effectively at our peril. We need to be able to ensure that as we move forward, they are retained, but they are also able to continue to contribute in the long term. And in part, that's about also looking at some targeted incentives in terms of retention and perhaps encouraging retraining. And a final point in terms of responses, much of what happens when you respond to um, an immediate shock is about what you can do today and tomorrow. So it's about investing in supporting the current workforce, today's workforce. We mustn't lose sight in that of planning and educating for tomorrow so that we're better prepared next time. Also recognizing that tomorrow will not look the same as today did or yesterday did. Uh, next slide, please. This is my final slide, just um, two or three final points. Um, very clear for me is that we need to be able to reach a situation where we have adaptive workforce strategies. We don't prepare a plan and assume it will be fixed there for the next 10 years. Things change. Things have always changed. Sometimes they are uh, big shocks like we're just facing now. Sometimes it's more a period of trends of change. We need to be able to adapt workforce strategies to these big changes. Secondly, recognizing that uh, education and workforce policy interventions, there's rarely a single solution. It's about coordinating solutions and perhaps sequencing them across a period of time to reach our workforce objectives. Uh, recognizing that it's not just a challenge or a problem within the workforce, the solutions are also about service redesign, relocation, better use of digi, health and telehealth and so on. So there's um, not just looking at the health workforce. And the final point, uh, often we focus on data and technical issues related to workforce planning. That is critical, but my view is always that we need to look at what is feasible and possible rather than trying to seek forever the, the perfect science, the perfect data. We need to move forward with the imperfections, but improve as we go. Thanks very much. And if I could just have the final slide. Uh, these are a couple of um, references which I, I've drawn on for the presentation. And uh, I'm more than happy uh, to also um, take questions and uh, either during the session or if you have my email, I'll be happy to correspond afterwards. My question, um, it's in two parts. If your country has a national workforce strategy, how does it need to be updated to take account of the pandemic? And if you don't have a national health workforce strategy, and not all countries do, 
Uh, what do you think should be the priority objectives of such a strategy or plan? Uh, given what I've said, you can agree with me um, or I'm more than happy if you disagree with me also. Thanks very much. Kim, I'm really grateful for that uh, pretty comprehensive overview, to be, uh, to be honest. I, I wonder whether we could stick those references in the chat. Uh, if, if that's at all uh, uh, possible. Um, so uh, Jim's given us a, a, an, an overview of the subject matter of the day. We've now got four speakers who are uh, going to give um, country case-specific um, uh, overviews and some of the responses to, uh, to shock um, in the, uh, by, through their own experience and through their own data. Um, the, and the, the next speaker is uh, uh, Tori Bungan A., who is an attache for the British High Commission in South Africa, uh, where she leads on supporting health system strengthening and uh, health policy. Welcome, Tori. Hi, hi, afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be, to be here. Great to see everybody. Um, yeah, so I am Tori Bungani, as, as uh, um, um, uh, Prof. Prof. Greg said, and I'm based at the British High Commission here in South Africa. And um, I, I, I oversee the Better Health Program, uh, which is a health system strengthening program, um, you know, aimed at, you know, uh, um, uh, empowering the, the various cogs of, of um, the country's uh, um, uh, health system. You know, we had a beautiful plan that we, we, we were going to implement um, starting at the beginning of 2020. Um, it, it, it had a very uh, strong uh, HRH um, uh, component that, that I'll, I'll touch on to um, uh, a, bit, a, a bit later on. And COVID happened just at the beginning of, 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 of our implementation. And what that meant is a very uh, quick pivoting that had to happen to support South Africa's health system navigate um, the, 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 the pandemic. So what I'd like to, to always start with is, 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 an, is an overview of, you know, um, a, a, a rapid induction on South Africa's uh, a, a, a health system. So if you just go on the next slide, because I, 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 you know, so, so this kind of helps to, to, to kind of, um, Put the context uh, a bit more clearly, and um, there, there, there are the links to 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 um, uh, shocks and uh, the implications on human resources become very, very clear. So, um, a lot, a lot of Africans are very much um, familiar with the whole quadruple uh, disease burden that we have here in the country, which includes, you know, uh, the infectious diseases, maternity, injury due to vi violence, and NCDs. And so, th this is, you know, just life. As no as normal. So during the during uh, the, the, the pandemic, um, uh, their uh, disease burdens uh, revealed two, two things. You know, um, uh, the one intervention that was taken very early on as part of our regulations is is controlling alcohol consumption because uh, the the, uh, the third uh, disease burden there tends to be fueled by by alcohol and their 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 the massive. Uh, um, um, a response that we had from healthcare workers was a drastic reduction in um, um, injury due to violence, due, due to uh, accidents, um, reduced significantly. And that, that they had they had a really uh, um, a good uh, um, uh, outcome. You know, wasn't wasn't the most popular stance to to restrict alcohol, but it did uh, it, um, um, indeed uh, work. And another. Uh, a part that came very very clear is the, the, the issue of, of non communicable diseases as a comorbidity for for um, for um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, infectious diseases, um, and you know, um, in, uh, in, then then uh, had an impact in in, in uh, designing um, guidelines on um, uh, shielding and so forth. A very important thing to know about the health system is the two the two tiered health system where we have an amazing um, uh, uh, private sector that is world class, um, um, which uh, which only caters to fifty percent of the country's population, and the 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 rest um, it, it, the rest of the country the rest of the country rely on on our public health system, and um, uh, as much is spent on the private sector as 
it is the public sector. So you can imagine very constrained resources and, 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 and a big impact on um, uh, the flows of, 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 of human resources um, uh, uh, in the country with, with uh, uh, naturally the private sector being the more desirable place for, 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 um, for, 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 for employment. Um, what was what came through uh, quite early on uh, in, in the pandemic was um, when there was, there was efforts to, to 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 buy services and buy personnel from the public sector um, uh, uh, by by the public sector from from the private sector was just their their the lack of um, consistency, the lack of parity, the lack of um, um, you know clear uh, patterns between the private and and, and public. Um, um, healthcare systems, um, the reimbursement um, uh, levels uh, you know, between the, the, the levels and, and, and methods between the two systems, um, try, trying to harmonize that was an interesting um, 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 learning for, for, for South Africa. And another thing about the health system that will come very, very important in, in, in thinking about health shocks is we have a um, we have nine provinces in the country, and um, the the way in which um, health spending and health health decisions are made is is is, is, in, is in a very federal type of way, um, where there's a lot of autonomy at provincial level on how um, uh, um, uh, spending is, is is done, and that has massive implications on how um, human resources for health are, are deployed and managed and tracked. Um, so you know the, uh, where the data sits, um, um, uh, who has a handle over it, and how policies are. Are, um, uh, are, are, are implemented. You know, given that you know, um, that, that, you know, uh, all that I've said, you, you can imagine we have a very, very overwhelmed um, public health care system, and um, you know, COVID really, really shown a light on this. I mean, we already knew that our health workers were facing general burnout, um, but you know, during COVID, that, that became very, very marked. You know, so so you know, you see empathy fatigue. You see, you know, um, a um, in, um, um, you know, we, we already have issues around patient safety uh, uh, reporting, and 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 um, you know, our um, med medical legal claims, which I think um, um, uh, is is probably more or less similar across the world. But we have you know very high medical legal legal uh, claims in general. Um, but an important uh, final point there is that the country is working hard to move forward to um, a much more efficient, much more equitable uh, univer universal health care uh, uh, coverage. And uh, the mechanism that, we, that they're using to, to move this forward or the, the, that, that, that we're currently working to move this forward is the national health insurance, um, which is similar to, to the UK's um, um, NHS. And a lot of groundwork obviously has to be done to, in order, to, in order, in order to, to, to get to the point where the NHI is implemented. And you know, a lot of work has been done by, by the country's government. And, and uh, um, we, the, the, the Better Health Program, are, are, are keen to, to support the country to move forward um, uh, with, with NHI. So as I said previously, you know, we had really great plans um, uh, as a better health program before COVID. And just to kind of give you a, a, a very, very quick um, uh, picture of our work. Next slide is just the, the, the better health program. So, so our focus areas are uh, as, 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 as uh, stated on the, on the slide and HRH sits, you know, um, as, a key mechanism in order for us to achieve universal health care coverage. And so our, our initial plans was to, to, to help um, um, the, the country's um, development of the HRH strategy and to then begin to create a roadmap to implementing it and to, 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 to um, support the, con the, the country's um, uh, plans on improving pipeline, to improving capacity um, of, of existing healthcare workers. Um, you know, so, so, you know, 
but all of that had um, had to be paused and we had to uh, respond to, to the COVID situation. So the next slide, I, I, I don't have much time anymore. Next slide, just, just you know, a, a little bit of the work that we did generally in COVID, but on HRH planning, uh, just to jump onto the next one so I can just, um, we, through our, uh, our, our delivery partners, um, yeah, so 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 if, if you can just jump 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 onto the next slide, so I can just uh, describe our HRH planning support. Um, we through our delivery partner McDonald's deployed uh, some technical assistance to work directly within the, the NDOH um, to start to develop uh, guidelines on the deployment of uh, um, uh, uh, healthcare workers. You know, um, you know. The one, the one thing I must say that um, 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 was highlighted, I think, for me is is um, we have this huge network of community healthcare workers in, in the country, uh, but they are uh, not necessarily um, uh, formalized, um, organized, and 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 you know um, it, they they are they are employed by different NGOs, and you know. COVID-19 showed, you know, the importance of having this humongous resource to be, to, to be much better, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, organized and, and, and use it a bit more uh, effectively because when it, you know, came down to it, we needed uh, the community health workers. But nonetheless, our work was working um, on, on, on creating um, Stuff and requirements for COVID nineteen, we 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 supported the country's um um really 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 great um knowledge uh, uh exchanges that they deployed constantly virtually for for uh HRA stuff to kind of you know stay abreast on on regulations stay abreast on you know uh, infection infection control and so on. We we drafted uh, recommendations for surge facilities and importantly. Um, to, to ensure safe working conditions for for for, for health workers, you know, uh, we we had to work in we had to work with um, you know uh, uh, trying to, to get databases and information to to, to get this done. But let me just um, I think the next slide um, is, is perhaps is 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 the most um, important point kind of to, to think around. So the challenges. Given the, the, the nature of how the health system is structured, we need to have a, 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 um, a an, an aggressive plan to to have accurate data because you can't make uh, good decisions, uh, best decisions as we can if you don't have the best data. So, so you know the federal nature of the health system here means that uh, information on 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 um, health worker movements, health worker levels, health worker, you know, it it it, it it's just not uh, consistent or, or, or easily um, um, uh, derived. You know, uh, th there was a real, str a real struggle in, in having you know um, uh, change management happen. And one of the things that we had wanted as a, as, as the Bread Health Program to put together um, or, or support the creation of is 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 is, is um, a, a workforce planning um, a, a group. You know, um, for, for, for the country, so that will become extremely important to, to, to put together so that you know we have a solid, solid understanding of um, how many. Health Health workers are weary at a time, uh, you know, at at, at, at national, district, uh, provincial level, um, and and you know, to, to be able to use this data more efficiently, we need to um, have a, a a a better way of of of, of, of tracking, um, you know, are these guidelines that we are creating um, are useful throughout? Are they being implemented the way that we we, we um, imagine they should be implemented? And right now, there really isn't. You know, um, um, a, a good strong uh, uh, core. So um, I, I think we can probably uh, just make 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 the next slide my my, my, my last. Um, yeah, so, so I'm going to so, have to move you on. Sorry, could you could you wrap up, please? Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. So we can. Um, so so I, I think my, my my question ultimately is given the nature of of. Um, you know the various challenges in countries, and we are working together now as 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 you know working together to to achieve global health security. What are the key key 
or, or the main things that people not, must consider, the main things that the policymakers must consider to ensure that um, we are on the same page on what what it'll take for us to 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 um, uh, effectively respond to the next shock. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, um, and welcome the, the South African input, is, uh, certainly from uh, Health Education England's perspective, it's become a very important partner in our, our um, a global understanding of workforce planning, so I'm, I'm grateful for your uh, uh, intervention and, and, and conversation there. I'm now going to introduce our third speaker, who's uh, Dr. Uh, Yassine Arabi, uh, who's chairman of the Intensive um, Care Department and Medical Director and a Professor of Respiratory Services at King Saab bin Abdulaziz uh, University of Health Sciences uh, and King Abdullah International Medical Research Center in Riyadh in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you here today. And uh, I'll, be, I'll try to reflect on the experience at the uh, uh, healthcare system or hospital level um, as a case study. Next slide, please. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been um, um, uh, country that was affected by corona infection uh, since 2012, where we had the MERS, uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And um, since 2012, as you could see here on the left part of the slide, there have been multiple waves, certainly not as big as the COVID waves, but they were um, um, of significant impact on the healthcare system. Um, uh, the MERS uh, is a disease that has very high fatality rate, a lot of unknowns, and really had led to important changes in our healthcare system. Uh, next slide, please. So one of uh, the things that really struck our hospital in 2015 is a major uh, MERS outbreak that affected 130 patients. Thir about one third of them were healthcare workers. And uh, many of these patients were admitted to the intensive care unit where I work, um, and um, many died, 50%, 53%. And you could see what would be impact on, on the healthcare system. It was massive. Uh, across the hospital, we had to close the emergency department, OR, close the clinic. We really shut down the whole hospital to stop transmission of the infection. Uh, but at the uh, level of healthcare workers, it, uh, it meant a lot of strain of the healthcare workers, especially with those working in ICUs or on the COVID wards. It meant that many of the healthcare workers had to um, deal with a lot of unknowns about this infection that is highly fatal. Uh, it meant that many of healthcare workers who been exposed at some point had to be uh, given time off, uh, adding to more to the um, uh, strain on the health on the staffing um, at, at different times. But the positive side, next slide, is that uh, really um, before this, I think this is an ex ex uh, just some statistics of MERS. It's a really highly um, uh, fatal disease associated with multi organ failure. This is an example of patients requiring um, invasive ventilation, ECMO, proning, pressors, etc. But the good news, next slide, is that uh, it, uh, this led to a transformation of our healthcare system. This is the peak of cases uh, in, in our ICUs. Three full ICUs, large ICUs, have been transferred to uh, manage uh, MERS at that time. Next slide, please. So uh, as a result of this, uh, we worked on improving our infectious disease emergency plan, the IDIP plan which is a hospital-wide response plan that detailed how we should re respond clinically and operationally to an outbreak. And it, this type of plan covered space, equipment, and as the subject of our discussion today, staff. And it is a phased approach, phase one, phase two, phase three. And for each phase, there are certain action to be taken. Uh, we, uh, so this plan was, uh, we worked on it with the MERS, and it was there in, in, uh, until, next slide, COVID came. And when COVID came, it turned out that this uh, ID plan to be really critical in our response. So Saudi Arabia in general um, has performed very well, actually, in responding to COVID-19. 
big part of this is related to the um, preparedness that resulted from the previous outbreak. There was a lot of, there were a lot of processes in place. There are a lot of plans. So it didn't take much time to deploy um, resources and work out the internal processes to respond. We went through uh, three waves of COVID as seen in the slide on the right, upper right, three waves. And these waves, as like in, in, in other, all other countries, they differ. The first wave was the hardest because um, lots, of, um, lo lots of unknowns. It is associated with the highest number of deaths. Um, and the second wave and third waves uh, were considerable number of patients, but less severe generally and fewer mortality. But from healthcare system, the response was different. In the first wave, almost the whole healthcare system was shut down and um, focus was mainly on COVID, while in the second and subsequent waves, uh, operations of the hospital had, had to continue. So it meant different uh, balance of uh, how we, we manage things in the intensive care units. Next slide, please. So to respond to help in expanding our pool of staff, uh, physician, nurses, and other, we, in the first wave, at least, we suspended all elective medical and surgical procedures. We expedited the credentialing processes. We reclaimed some of the critical care trained staff who are in other departments um, and tried to work on uh, hiring retired critical care training staff. We uh, temporarily uh, redeployed healthcare workers and trainees to the ICU. So all our residents and trainees who are working in other departments were pulled back to work in the, in the intensive care unit. Next slide. Um, we also created a uh, training program quickly to uh, using um, tra different training methodologies, including simulation to non-ICU clinicians who are assigned now to work in the ICU. Um, we use the technology to help in uh, managing uh, critically ill patients. And um, we had some restructuring of our service as I'm gonna show in a, in a follow-up slide. Next, please. So we, we had to, we expanded tremendously during, especially the first wave to be able to co cope with the surge of cases. So we designed ICUs to two levels, level one, which are the current ICUs covered by the current ICU staff who are full trained in ICU, but level two ICU, we converted certain wards, recovery room. Um, we plan to cover uh, the OR, uh, convert the OR and day surgery. We did not need to reach this point, but the wards and recovery room. And these were covered by our colleagues from the Department of Anesthesia and Medicine after um, uh, getting some in services and training. Also from nursing, we had to use uh, ward nurses who were upscaled to the um, uh, upscale to, to be manage uh, higher acuity patients. Next slide, please. We did simulation sessions for nurses and uh, physicians in, uh, to cover things related to infection control, safe management skills, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some pictures from these training sessions. Next. Um, we, um, during the big pandemic, our single rooms in the ICU is now converted to take care of two patients. Uh, and that helped in um, uh, staffing because then uh, one nurse can cover more than the usual staffing, even for sick patients. Uh, um, it creates some problems. I mean, doubling is not doubling patients in the same room has its concerns, but, um, but uh, I think it solved uh, issues in, in capacity. Next slide. So these are some solutions that we use, and this is how we publish this in, uh, in intensive care medicine. So try to work on optimizing the proper use of ICU staff by increasing the number of patients per staff. We canceled vacations during the first wave. Um, uh, we increased working hours to some extent redeployed retrained staff or working in other areas. Obviously these solutions um, are okay for a very short term, but they have their own uh, uh, 
um, problems. We had to use hospital staff to cover ICU patients by putting people from other areas, by redistribution of certain tasks. Uh, we created, for example, uh, a procedure team who helped unloading the work on the ICU staff so they can take care of more patients. We scaled down non-essential activities such as elective surgeries. Uh, we tried to, uh, we worked on non-hospital staff uh, from other hospitals and other cities. Um, uh, the limitation of this that, that uh, um, everybody was having issues with COVID, so it wasn't very feasible. Um, uh, also transfer patient to less resort and or uh, from less resource to better resource hospitals. Um, uh, it, it did help uh, partially during the peak of cases. Next slide. Uh, we also worked on supporting our staff. And seriously, I think that's very important to show the support by different levels, reducing contact uh, and uh, the risk of risk. Next slide. Um, so um, making available all infection control, uh, personal uh, protective equipment. Uh, next slide. Uh, during, uh, this is an example of our ICO, we, people using the, uh, the PPEs. Next slide, please. Uh, we also, during the peak, um, no, dealing with the unknown, uh, we uh, invented a uh, way of getting our equipments outside the room. So these are IV pumps and monitor of a ventilator. So the, the nurse or the healthcare worker doesn't have to go unnecessarily to inside the room to manage the patient uh, if, uh, unless there is a clinical reason. So that will reduce the contact. Next slide. Uh, the communication with family is, was so important and with patients. So we used technology, this, uh, this example of one of our wards that was not designed to be ICU. So the visibility on the rooms to the outside was limited. So we installed cameras and, um, and these are the monitors outside. So the nurse who is covering from outside can see multiple patients. Uh, next. We facilitated communication between our patients. This is one of our patients and families through uh, video conferencing. Next slide, please. I think it's so important to show the support to the staff. I, we did daily executive rounds. Uh, we had the noon meeting during, especially during the peak of cases. Um, we had managers available and uh, interdepartmental uh, collaboration. Next slide. So the question, uh, which is a broad question, but I, I, I think just an open-ended question, what's a, what are the key components of successful uh, staffing uh, for a pandemic response? Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you too very much. I, I, again, very stimulating and, and again, a different slant and a different optic from the South African experience. I was particularly interested in the, the pump priming effect of the MERS uh, outbreak and, and um, uh, I'll maybe come back to you later for you to, to give us some sort of sense of how you felt that prepared you uh, both psychologically and, and um, um, uh, practically for for uh, for the COVID response. So thank you very much indeed. We'll we'll come back to that one. Um, our fourth speaker uh, is um, Professor Gareth Rees, uh, who uh, originates from New Zealand but is currently based at the Isan University in Lima, Peru. Uh, his expertise is is um, in the use of foresight to assist with health workforce planning and development. And he's worked closely on a range of health uh, workforce projects, including with the World Health Organization, the Pan American uh, Health Organization, and with the EU SEPIN uh, project. So, uh, Professor Gareth, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about Peru. Uh, and uh, what I'll do is just very similar to the previous presentation there uh, by uh, Professor Abi about uh, a case study about Peru and its response. Uh, to Peru uh, to the COVID-19 situation. Uh, next slide, please. Just an uh, introduction to Peru. It's a, a country uh, that's on the um, Pacific coast of South America. And it's a country which has sort of three uh, 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 environmental zones. There's the coastal uh, desert, and then there's the highlands of the Andes. And then we've got the other side uh, going into the, uh, um, the uh, Amazon basin. And so there's these different 
uh, demograph uh, demographics associated with these different regions. And we can see they're just some simple uh, data about Peru. Uh, and these numbers have been increasing uh, since the 1980s or improving since the 1980s when the country had significant economic collapse. Uh, one of the things about Peru, like South Africa, it's dealing with these multiple uh, health issues. It's putting pressure on the system. And so the system is uh, trying to catch up with the non-communicable diseases along side persistent diseases of underdevelopment. Uh, and there's also this gap between rural and urban populations like many uh, Latin American countries. There's uh, large numbers in big cities, these mega urban places like Lima has a third of Peru's population and it runs over 10 million people. Uh, and the rest of the population is spread out across the country. First language is Spanish, but there are a number of native speakers. And again, for older people, this could be uh, a barrier to receiving health care. Uh, next slide, please. So the health system in Peru, and you can see from this diagram here, is quite fragmented and chaotic. Uh, the, la the lion's share of it over sort of the left-hand side is the public sector, but we can see there these pillars of separate uh, um, delivery uh, from regional government and the ministers of health uh, and interior where the police and the armed forces actually have separate health systems, uh, you know, totally divor uh, divorced from the other part of the public sector. And we see regional government and ministry of health uh, there uh, collaborating to deliver a hospital level care uh, down through to clinics in the more regional areas. And so this is a very institutionalized a focused and silo focused health system around specialties and hospitals uh, with a, 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 a lower level of primary care across uh, the um, across the system. And so we also have this Ministry of Labor uh, part of the system, which is 25% um, of the population through a worker based uh, social insurance. Uh, and this is for workers uh, contribute to this and they get access to it. And that is again, separate from uh, the uh, publicly funded health uh, uh, care system, which is available to people as sort of as a backstop and that insurance covers a, a lower range of care. And then we have this small but important uh, private sector. Again, this is divorced from the rest of the system and operates uh, through privately paid insurance and it tends to be at a higher level. Uh, and obviously people with more economic means will be able to access that system. That accounts for around about 10% of the population. Next slide, please. So um, universal health coverage has been improving in Peru. We can see that black line dropping down there, uh, getting to around about 80% of the population covered through either the SIS, which is the government scheme, the green is the SALUD, the worker coverage, and then we have private cover and other, the small amount there. So we still have a little bit of a way to go here in Peru to get uh, universal health coverage, but the significant gains have been made over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Next slide, please. So the health workforce in Peru, one of the things that has helped really with the shock and COVID is this understanding, this investment and in understanding uh, what the workforce is or who the workers are. And this has been an investment over the last 10 years and understanding uh, the workforce through studies. And so this um, has shown us that the health, the health worker numbers are growing over time and we've seen significant growth here, 27%. Uh, over the five years before the pandemic hit. Uh, the head count uh, middle of pandemic was just over 200,000 people. But what we see similar to South Africa is these low worker densities. Uh, and so doctor and nurse numbers of Peru are quite low compared to the benchmark of Latin America and Caribbean, which are the countries that surround us in the, uh, in the Pajo region. And so this again is uh, fueling uh, this access problems and also issues around uh, do we have enough workers in uh, the right place at the right time for the people who need it. Next slide please. So there's the COVID-19, it's very similar uh, to many other countries. We had three waves here and you can see each wave uh, in the top graph there, uh, they're bimodial. And so some of the approaches of lockdowns and uh, restricting uh, people uh, gathering, uh, flattened the curve in terms of the numbers, but then uh, that started to fail and each of the infected, those, those two curves uh, had this, um, this sort of bimodial pattern. And this led to the death rate being quite high. There's the first one, the first uh, 
range of death there. Uh, we can see there that the deaths rose uh, and then the lockdown sort of failed and then we had another peak coming after that. Uh, and then the second wave that we had was mainly the Lambda variant here uh, was predominant in that second wave. And again, that has that bimodal pattern. We can see there a higher number of deaths because Lambda was uh, appeared to be a little bit more severe uh, with people. And these uh, infections are quite long as well. And so while they're flat, they were long and they were deep into the population uh, in terms of the effect that it had. And this has led Peru to be one of the highest death rates uh, per capita countries. And there we see that typical spike of, um, of Omicron that we've just experienced. And we can see the impact of uh, vaccinations. The vaccination started uh, uh, just after the um, second wave really hit. Uh, with health workers first and then the general population rollout. And as we have now, we've got uh, into the high 70s or low 80s of double vaccinated people with booster numbers coming up uh, there. And so uh, Peru responded very well or, or quite um, um, uh, well, considering some of the issues uh, that it deals with in terms of the vaccination. Next slide, please. And so what happened in Peru with, these, with that pattern was is that we had early and lengthy lockdowns uh, but we were still one of the worst hit uh, countries in Latin America. And this is because uh, we don't have social insurance or social protection here. And so uh, people stopped working uh, as we had the lockdown. And then in the end, the lockdown sort of failed around about week 10 because of economic needs, social pressures on the population. About only about 27% of the population have refrigerators. So people had to go out. Uh, and mingle, buy food and things like that. And this is contributing uh, to that bimodal pattern there of uh, infections there. Uh, the government responded by mobilizing uh, uh, a number of uh, emergency regulations, but they used primarily existing resources uh, and was redeploying to, um, to meet the needs there. Health workers in Peru were particularly at high risk early on uh, in the uh, pandemic, and we had a significant number of health worker deaths there. Uh, in the middle of uh, 2021, uh, just over a thousand uh, doctors and nurses uh, had succumbed to COVID-19. Next slide, please. And so what do we do here in Peru responding to this? And the, um, the, there was three sort of groups of responses. First one dealt with shortages, and then there was about availability of the workforce, and lastly, protecting the workforce. Now, the shortages are uh, a part of uh, the Peruvian uh, health uh, health system and so one of the things was was looking to how they could um, manage that and so the idea here was uh, isolating workers to make sure that they weren't passing uh, COVID on uh, and testing was prioritized in the workforce as well rather than general population to try to manage that and limit uh, the number of people who were being uh, taken out of the workforce because of infection. And then we think about availability. This is trying to mobilize and maximize our workforce uh, to deal with these surges that were happening. And the good planning that had gone ahead uh, over the previous years meant that uh, Peru knew a lot about its workforce and there was able to actually put in place some of these mobilization actions. And so we have a number there uh, of uh, similar types of uh, actions that we saw in um, Saudi Arabia and South Africa and that uh, Jim Buchan also talked about in the start. Um, and so we're looking here about uh, redeploying health workers or bringing in new health workers uh, into the system to be able to cope with the surges, uh, using medical students uh, as, um, as a way of bolstering the number of workers in hospitals, uh, but re re recruiting and retaining. Remember, we have these silos in Peru of the system, and so we're bringing people out of the private sector to work in the public sector hospitals as the major response. And some of these people were brought in to overflow hospitals uh, as well. And so we're also looking to uh, follow the wave around the country. And so rather than having numbers in these different places to respond, as, as num case numbers uh, rose, we would deploy cadres and they would go to these places uh, to bolster that as well. And so mobility was one factor in response as well. We also had uh, health professionals come from overseas as well uh, and uh, mobile brigades coming. And so to keep the health workforce there, we had um, procurement of uh, uh, personal protection equipment, but also mental health awareness and counselling was put in place for health workers as well, something that Jim pointed to earlier on. Uh, and also a big part of training. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is the last slide about the lessons. And one of the things that was, was the redeployment and management of existing resources through this uh, fragmented system. And so this fragmentation was able to be overcome because of they had the uh, knowledge of what uh, the workforce capabilities were and where the people were as well. Uh, but COVID has reinforced this longer term view that we need to improve working conditions and job security for health workers here in Peru, both uh, in the uh, public sector, but also looking at private sector uh, as well. And so we've experienced some new roles and uh, deployed new skills in different places. And hopefully the, with the recent planning session that the Ministry of Health uh, organized uh, uh, just at the end of the last year, where over 200 stakeholders come, we can take those lessons of how Peru can mobilize its workforce uh, and use that as a planning frame for the next five years. So let's just finish off with a question that I'm going to pose for you. Next slide, please. And my question is a two-part question as well as how do you see these lessons applying to your country's experiences with COVID? Did you do similar things or was it completely different? And do you have any lessons or country experiences that you want to share that could assist a country like Peru uh, in responding perhaps next time. So thank you for your time. I'm glad to be uh, a part of this session. Gareth, that was brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, really grateful uh, for that um, intervention. Um, in terms of uh, our final speaker uh, today, uh, can I introduce Nicole McIntosh, uh, who is the uh, London and Regional uh, Head of Nursing and Midwifery here in the UK. Um, Nicole works closely with a wide range of partners to educate, develop and sustain uh, the nursing and midwifery workforce in London. Uh, she has recently become an honorary visiting professor at City University and she's also an editorial advisor at the Royal College of Nursing's Institute and Nursing Management Journal. In her spare time, she's also a published poet, I believe. So uh, proving that she's very much uh, as a hinterland uh, well beyond nursing. Nicole, welcome. Thank you, Professor Burns. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here and to represent London and nursing at a time that we are celebrating the health and care workers. Next slide, please. I'd like to give a brief overview of what London looks like in terms of health and then focus heavily on the impact mm, of COVID. I don't know that. One second, please. can always depend on Alexa to come in just when you don't want her to. So yes, I'll focus on the impact of COVID. Next slide, please. So in terms of London, London is one of seven regions in, the, in England. And we at Health Education England, we support the delivery of excellent healthcare and supporting students. So the future workforce, as well as the current workforce, but we work very closely with another arm's length body, NHS England and Improvement. And together at a regional level, we support the ICSs. These are the sub-regional um, healthcare systems. While it is a changing um, landscape and it's always changing in healthcare, I think that um, will be reflected globally. It's important for us to understand the the relationship between regional work and a national architecture. So London is very, very proud to be a diverse city. We're an inclusive city, and we reflect this in all the works that we do. Uh, the capital uh, coordinates services and plans in a way that improves population health and do, do our best to always have health inequalities reduction at the heart of what we do. Next slide, please. This just gives you a, a snapshot at a glance of how, how huge and complex the challenge is just for London. So in terms of the population, there are over 9 million people living here. We have five integrated care systems, but we have a lot of people who commute into London to work. So London supports a wider healthcare system than just the city. Next slide, please. In terms of nursing, nursing is one of the professions we are highly rated as being well trusted in all the surveys year on year, but it, it presents amazing opportunities in those five areas. Education is one that I'm very passionate about, but also at management. 
So growing our own next generation of compassionate nursing leaders. What the pandemic has shown is that while we were ready to celebrate the year of the nurse, the International Year of the Nurse in 2020, COVID, the big shock of COVID had other plans. But it's an exciting time to be a nurse. And what we will show in the next couple of slides is the impact of COVID on people choosing nursing as a career. So yes, the pandemic has really highlighted what nurses do internationally and locally. Next slide, please. I think it's very important and I'm passionate in all my works that I do that we champion the nursing voice, that we amplify that voice, that we are articulate, bold and courageous in amplifying that, that voice locally, regionally, nationally, and not globally. So that's why this opportunity to be here is really important. Next slide, please. We've seen, as I said before, that COVID in effect has really shone the light on what nursing and nurses do. And we've seen an increase. So the universities and colleges admission service, UCAS for short, produced an insight report in January this year, looking at who exactly are the future nurses. And it was quite insightful because we've seen an increase, a record number of 18 year olds who are choosing nursing as a career. And they cite personal experiences of a nurse or someone in, on TV who they aspire to be like. So this shows that the image of nursing is being transformed and we are part of the We Are the NHS campaign. So this is a campaign to look at the diverse roles of nursing. So, you know, work, nurses working in district nursing, in the acute sector, just showing that there is a real amazing opportunity for you to find what you're passionate about and pursue that. We've seen more mature students, those over 21, if you can call them mature, um, uh, applying as well. So that's really positive to see, real good age range. Thank you. Next slide, please. Again, if you look at the key findings of the report, nursing joins education and health and social care as one of only three subjects where more young people from the most disadvantaged uh, areas in the UK choose to study. So that's really, I'll come on to that in terms of widening participation and widening access, but that's really heartening to see that almost disadvantaged are getting the opportunity to self-actualize. Mental health nursing has received a most welcome boost because that's an area that we need to have more um, focus for the workforce. So we've seen a 30% increase and we've seen that there is still this gender gap that we need to work on. As you can see there, there are more, women are more than nine times more likely to apply for, for, for nursing programs. And that's something that's an untapped resource in terms of all male nurses and role models that other male students can aspire to. And next slide, please. This is just, um, it's a busy slide, but what I'll focus is on, on the right-hand side for now in the widening participation. So equality, diversity, and inclusion are core values of the NHS. We're always aiming to ensure that we have a level playing field, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. People from the nine protected characteristics of the Equality Act report that there are variations in terms of access, in terms of progression. So diversity and improving equality and inclusion are, are, are driving forces that get, up, get us out of bed in the morning. And the diversity profile of the healthcare system does not currently reflect accurately the, the population. So there is a lot more work to do. There's further improvement to improve um, progression for people who are from underrepresented areas. On the right, on the left hand side, you'll see that we're looking at just about four of the elements of the protected characteristics in terms of sex and um, if you hold a vocational qualification, what your ethnicity is. And there is some disparity in terms of whether you're under 21 and more likely as a male to apply or uh, someone from my background or BME background, if you're over 21 or under 21. So there's some work that our business intelligence teams will be doing to help us to kind of focus our campaigns. Next slide, please. In terms of the impact of COVID on current students, it has been, we have done two studies so far, just after the first wave and then after the third wave. And we've seen some worrying trends in terms of the students who really came to the fore 
in the middle of a pandemic, they came forward to help. But they're saying that they're worried about things like catching up, you know, things that they missed out on. We switched to virtual. So they're worried about actually going into the workforce and not feeling as prepared. So our preceptorship program is very important here where that period after qualifying and just you know, to integrate into what it is like to be a registered practitioner. We're doing some really focused work to ensure that we meet people where they are and not make assumptions that they should know it all and just to kind of help them to, to navigate their early careers. Next slide, please. There's three takeaway messages from the impact of COVID survey was that there were mixed experiences. London came out a little bit better than other regions, but we're still trying to drill down as to what that was. We have the capital programs, the capital nurse program, where there's a, it's like a social movement, a sense of identity. We're not sure if that played a part in terms of students feeling really connected to the workforce. There were some concerns about confidence you know so as i said before people are worried students are worried that they might be coming out at the other end and the expectation is that they're ready to run but actually what we need to do for this cohort is to give them additional support and support to do clinical skills as well so our current workforce needs to be mindful that the students who are coming through have been through a lot and we need to be, really be looking after them so some tough choices, but we are really joined up in terms of our approach to addressing those. Next slide, please. In terms of the impact in summary, as I said before, academic concerns. So we're working with our universities to make sure that we address some of these concerns, you know, getting extensions for assignments where students have had to switch to do extended clinical placements to help us out in the middle of a pandemic, I might add. So people are doubting their clinical ability. So we're putting on additional sessions for simulation, you know, improving the placement capacity. So lots and lots of work to ensure that the nursing workforce remains strong and that the students who are coming through feel supported and want to stay with us. Next slide, please. In terms of the lessons that we've learned, technology, really quickly we had to learn to use Zoom and then we had to learn to use Microsoft Teams. So it's been a journey for all of us really and the students have embraced this. So I think going forward from the shock of COVID is embracing what has worked well in terms of hybrid working, hybrid learning, you know, te using technology, collaborating with stakeholders from a wide geographical area as well to share innovation, to learn from global partners, supporting the widening access. It's really important that we encourage our local people to want to work in our local systems and to stay there because they have a vested interest in, in, in making sure that we have a good domestic supply listening and acting on the views of students. So it's no point just surveying, but actually hearing what they're saying and putting policy to meet the, the, the feedback that we're getting and amplifying the student voice. So we're developing councils, student councils, students share decision-making councils to put students at the forefront of what we do so that they're exposed to policy from a very early stage. And promoting this psychologically safe culture where no question is silly, you make a mistake, we learn from it, a learning culture as opposed to a blame culture. And as you said before, I'm a, I'm a poet, so I promote the use of the use of the arts, you know, drama, talking therapy in terms of improving health and well-being. And we had a recent webinar where we looked at this whole thing of how are you today? I'm fine, but actually, are you really fine? And just kind of creating that psychologically safe place for our workforce as we get over the shock, if we can ever get over the shock of COVID and move to the other side, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And, I, and, and this has just been a really um, speedy um, go through, but I have a question. And my question is, what are the top three innovative healthcare practices that you'll be taking forward from your COVID experiences? We've learned so much. But top three, because I'd really like to learn from the global audience. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, may have been last on the order, but that's definitely the most challenging question, I think, so far. Uh, so uh, many thanks. I wonder if our speakers, if we could take the slides down, please, and I could have our five speakers uh, with their cameras on, if that's possible. If 
thank you all very much indeed once again for a, a really brilliant set of uh, a presentation so my team have been working in the background uh, with much industry compressing uh, the q a and the chat into a series of testing um, challenges for the five of you uh, but just to start off with it struck me as I was listening to you that um, I mean, I'm, I'm a surgeon by, by background and therefore have a very simple brain. And it, it, it strikes me that, um, that we saw four countries experience of, uh, uh, of the pandemic. And uh, that if you created a, an experiential um, chart uh, the, 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 with four circles for those four countries, there would be uh, a set of shared experiences and then a set of experiences that are either individual or not shared by everybody. And it then struck me that if one was trying to uh, develop, strategically develop a global pandemic preparedness set of standards, the overlapping uh, experiences would be the basis of those. And in addition to that, there is um, a, a demand, therefore, of the, the stuff that isn't overlapping to be shared within a global a, a global platform. Um, and so, so, and that really, I guess, uh, goes to something that Jim uh, originally said. In fact, all of you have mentioned how important it is uh, to develop an adaptive and integrated strategy uh, for shocks in the system. So my, my first question is, what are the common key factors in doing this successfully? And I, I'm going to ask uh, Jim, I think, to start as he's um, uh, at risk of uh, um, getting tired at first, I suspect, as he was the first to speak. Jim. Well, I'm still awake, having listened to another four very good presentations, so you didn't catch me out with that one. Um, if it was easy, we wouldn't be having the webinar. Uh, the issues around integration, I think, are... I've been aware of it being discussed for at least 20 years in terms of integrating workforce planning within systems and between systems in terms of those delivering health and care. Um, we're not there yet. I think we need to recognize that uh, there are a couple of underpinning issues that need to be there in order to support integration. One is that we, we need reasonably good and consistent data uh, across the, the different elements that we're trying to integrate in terms of numbers, skills, locations. Uh, without that, we are, I think, doomed to failure from, from day one. Secondly, uh, beyond that, we need to be very clear what do we mean by integration? And I think this comes at um, several le levels. They're not mutually exclusive, but we need to be clear what we mean when we say integration. Um, are we looking at completely integrating different components within a country into a single whole. So many countries have a, a separate uh, care or uh, nursing home sector from acute care or hospital or, or national health service. So are we trying to bring all of those together nationally? Um, or are we rather looking at something which is less ambitious, but is just bringing together uh, the ability to plan across those different systems. If we do that, that may in time encourage full integration, but is in itself um, ambitious, but, but in, the, in many senses necessary if we're gonna have full efficiency. So uh, how do we set up the mechanics of the planning process to cover different elements? And how do we ensure that the different elements are engaged in that process. That would be, I think, my, my critical question. The third element of integration is the one that we're all aiming for, which is at local level, we have integrated teams. Uh, so we don't plan doctors in isolation from nurses in isolation from dietitians in isolation from social workers. We're looking at, we need a team, we need to deliver a package of services on the ground. What does that mean for the different components within it in terms of uh, current health professionals and workers or perhaps even developing new ones. So I've set a challenge there, which is integration at different levels. Uh, they're not exclusive from each other. The most ambitious is the idea of fully integrating services nationally. And that's um, not gonna be on the agenda in many countries in the foreseeable future. I think the others can be. 
so we can build up towards that as the ultimate goal. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Can I just come back just just on something on that? Is do, do you see a, a a role? This is one of those questions where you can't really say no. But do, do you see a role uh, for uh, 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 international? peer-to-peer -peer relationship at, at on a front line as being a potential part solution to pandemic preparedness and an adaptive strategy. I mean, one of the bits of learning, certainly, I think, uh, uh, from a UK perspective, is I, I, I do feel that if our peer-to-peer -peer front line relationships had been stronger with other peers across the planet, uh, we may have been able to uh, a, a, adapt and become more resilient in the initial part of the pandemic. I, I wondered whether you, you feel that that might be a piece of this jigsaw that's missing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can argue that the knowledge transfer within systems has often been less than optimal. And then if you look across countries and different systems, you've then got potentially additional barriers to that transfer of knowledge. I think what we have seen during the pandemic are very good examples of, of clearing houses being developed from uh, different WHO regional offices by OECD, for example, where if you're in country A and you're concerned about surge, you can very quickly check with what other countries are doing and be given a contact perhaps in that country to learn the, the more technical aspects of what's going on. The ability to develop communities of practice in this area, I think, are recognised, uh, but um, require a bit more coherent support, I think, in order to optimise and, and sustain the potential benefits that, that can accrue. Hey, thanks. So um, I'll ask the other four panel members, do they have any comments on what Jim has said or have a direct answer to the, to the opening question? Yeah, I'd like to just jump in here, uh, Jet, uh, and sort of follow on with what Jim was uh, pointing to there. I think one of the things that we see in some health systems is there are significant traditions based around how that system uh, developed over time, and that frames how the workforce is viewed or how it may be being deployed as well. And I think one of the things that we could have as a, a guide for pandemic or, or surge um, uh, responses is learning from the things that went well when we were responding to this crisis. Uh, if we look at Peru here, we know that we have less than optimal numbers and we know that we have a fragmented health system, but the pandemic enabled a lot more collaboration and deployment of workforces that we didn't see before. So how can we crystallize that? How can that become a catalyst for the way that we view or the way that we want to see the health system working in the future. So it may not wholly be about numbers, but looking at the way we work. And I think that supports what Jim is saying around about our view of integration. We really want to integrate these silos in Peru, but we have these traditions and these barriers that are built up within the system. Now we can push against those and try, you know, um, you know, to be Hercules and push down those things. But really at the end of the day, I think we need to be adapting and adopting some new practices through this crisis that we've learned from, and then say, well, could the vision of the future be different? And accept that, and then maybe wrap our arms around that to move forward um, in a way, uh, you know, that, that, that the crisis hasn't been such a deficit to many people as well. And so I see this as a real opportunity in terms of workforce planning, in terms of a wider vision, but also in the practical thing, in terms of deployment of skills. And we saw this in the hospital uh, thing in, in Saudi Arabia, where you know, they use their ICU staff in different ways, but they had a system for enabling that. They had their core ICU focusing on and at a secondary ICU level. And that was how in Peru here, the, the overflows worked as well. So there was higher level ICU and traditional hospital setting, but then a care structure for the wider number or these high numbers of cases coming in that needed care, but not at that hospital level. And so we are deploying people in different ways. We're valuing skills in different ways. And can we crystallize that or catalyze that to change in the way that we view health workforces? Thanks, Gareth. Anybody else before I move on? 
Okay, we seem to have lost Tori, uh, which is a shame actually, because I was going to aim my next question at her. But um, so, so just thinking perhaps slightly differently um, on a macro level, um, what are the mechanisms where we ensure adequate investment uh, in health system, uh, not just in the health system, but in the health workforce, uh, particularly? Um, uh, in light of COVID-19. And I, I, I don't specifically just mean in terms um, of pandemic preparedness, but uh, the general issues about uh, underinvestment in workforce compared to, to service. Um, I wonder if uh, Prof Yazin might want to answer that in the first uh, instance. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think the COVID-19 uh, pandemic highlighted uh, many deficiencies in healthcare systems and um, areas that really need improvement. Um, and um, I think in, um, for example, I think it's exposed the difficulty in recruitment with COVID-19, all countries were affected similarly. So even um, using workforces from other countries was, very, very challenging. Um, recruitment and retention were a problem. Um, so while we are focusing on the recruitment, we need to also focus on how to keep our existing workforce because at the end of the day, this is really the center of, um, of our response. So I think we need to work on um, recruitment, work on, the, as uh, Nicole discussed, how to get more people in engage in nursing, engage in the critical specialties that we, we need, but also at the same time, work on not to lose the existing people, which did happen during COVID-19. There was a lot of burnout. Um, there were people affected by the infection as well. Uh, in MERSCO, we, uh, healthcare workers constituted 10% of the, of the patients. So 10%, uh, that's a lot of patients. In COVID-19, probably overall it was less than this, but uh, it remains substantial. And um, um, even though those who were, um, had milder infected infection affected the workforce because of the, think about the time off and how, how it strained our, uh, our um, manpower. I don't know if that answers your question, but this, this is from a hospital kind of management level. It's very helpful, yeah. Uh, Nicole, you want to come in? Yes, I think um, the point is well made in terms of, we have to look at, at this through the lens of COVID and current staff who are exhausted, have been through several waves and are you know, indicating that the first opportunity they get, they're going to get to retire or to reduce hours. So now is the time for us to really have our compassionate leaders at the forefront talking about health and well-being, being very open about the personal challenges on them. But I think that international recruitment, someone posed a question, ethical international recruitment, because actually, if we are to prepare for the next big shock, global big shock, we need to be mindful that it's, it's, this reliance on international recruitment is high risk. So growing our own and starting from very early in terms of of, of the next generation of healthcare leaders. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, just that focus for me on the domestic supply. Yeah, so from very early going into schools and selling careers, but actually calling out poor practice in leaders who are currently in place. So where you know that there is a leader who is known as a bully, people say, oh, they're very talented, but actually for me, the talent doesn't override the fact that they, they do harm. So that we, if we are to retain the current workforce, we have to really treat them well and focus on health and well-being. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm struck. In, I work part time uh, clinically, and, and um, I, I am struck by the paradox of of, of recovery uh, in the UK system, uh, which and the, the paradox goes something like this: that um, uh, we've worked uh, our frontline staff. Uh, to the point of, of um, uh, collapse, uh, but the recovery or, or the, the pandemic itself has caused um, a backlog in um, activity uh, and um, a poorer quality of care. Therefore, the response to that 
uh, is to try to get the staff to be even more productive. And, and there, that there is a there is a risk in this, I think, and um, and, I, and I suppose that sort of naturally segues onto the, the next question, really, which is, you know, what are the um, uh, staff safety, uh, health and well-being initiatives that are being delivered across the globe uh, to prevent uh, this this general fallover of staffing, not just attrition. Uh, but also mental health, um, mental health issues, poor productivity, uh, lack of, of staff satisfaction, and of course the image that that gives to the next generation of healthcare workers. Uh, I wonder whether, sorry, I, we lost you for a little bit there, but I, I wonder um, where, if you could maybe uh, give us an idea of what strategies are taking place in South Africa uh, in terms of staff health and well-being to kick the conversation off. Yeah, I'm, I mean. Um... The starting point was to actually speak about it. I mean, we, we, we um, so um, last year, um, the, the president, in fact, um, um, uh, alongside the minister, led a conversation ar ar around, you know, um, realizing that, you know, uh, workforce is um, uh, overwhelmed um, and, and, and there is burnout, you know, so, 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 so how, how do we, you know, deal with, the, you know, um, that fact? So, so the, you know, the important thing was to first acknowledge that this is a reality and, and initially have a, a, a conversation um, um, that, that, that included, um, um, you know, not just healthcare workers and, 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 and um, um, uh, leadership, but, but the whole of the country. So you know there was an open webinar to kind of kind of to, 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 so that you know um, even uh, people who receive care understand that you know uh, we um, our, our public health care um, workers are, are are overwhelmed right now and in, in also in 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 in, um, in sort of uh, in the COVID um, uh, messaging was the fact you know the you know we, we keep saying these are our heroes but our behaviors you know um um. um uh, if, if you're acting in behaviors that make you at risk of, of, of being a patient, then you're not being a, um, um, a, 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 you know, a pose, a pose is not enough, exactly. So, um, you know, there is a new 2030 strategy that's been created by, by, by the, um, the national department that touches specifically on, 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 on recovery well being on, um, you know, um, how, to, how, how, how do you create environments where, um, uh, you know, th th there is no uh, blame, but there's learning. And I, th I think that's something we learned a lot as, um, as, as, as well from, from the NHS uh, model. How do you create environments where um, uh, people can, can, can um, be vulnerable without being uh, maligned, you know? Um, so, so, so th 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 there is, you know, so um, uh, we work with the quality improvement, quality assurance uh, uh, director to, to try and, and, and create those policies and, and create, create the advocacy so that, um, you know, um, whether or not, you know, that will result in, in, in actual uh, change is, is yet to be seen, but at least the conversation has started, the, 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 there is legislation there and, you know, um, and, and uh, you know, ha having people, uh, ordinary people as well, um, um, you know, uphold and, and, and take accountability for, for health worker wellness is, 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 is important. Yeah, so, so, so that's a, a small sort of a glimpse from, from, from my side, and I'll, I'll hand over back to you, Prof. Uh, uh, may, I don't know who wants to speak on the UK experience. Nicole, do you, do you want to come in? Yes, I think it's really important, uh, as, as Tori says, to have leaders who are humble. Uh, that humility for me, um, we don't see enough leaders who are able to come out and, 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 and say, say how they really feel without fear of, of, as you say, being maligned. But actually what staff are saying when, I, when, we, go, when we do talks is that it's refreshing to get a leader who you ask a question and the answer. So talking about health and well-being, really important. Um, and that that whole learning through COVID as opposed to the blaming uh, is where, where I, I, I think we need to start building from. But actually having more forums where we learn from global leaders as well. So yes, uh, I think the learning from COVID um, 
it, it is a shock and it is still a shock. I think having more representation from the nine protected characteristics in leaders, seeing people seeing that there's hope for their careers will retain staff as well. So yeah, um, work to do, but I think the conversation has shifted. Um, I think that's where I'll stop. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Jim, you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of contribute to, to the discussion around particularly issues related to uh, staff burnout. The, one of the references I provided, I did a very quick snapshot at the beginning of the year of um, nurse burnout stress, PSDD across countries. And um, frankly, personally was horrified by the results in terms of the extent to which this is a um, variable but global problem with significant proportions of nurses um, in burnout. And um, the point Nicole made earlier on, some countries are going to have to face up to what amounts to a big, uh, a very big quit of nurses. Older nurses who've stayed on or come back uh, worked beyond hours, very challenging workloads for more than two years now. And the, the issue here is that uh, we, we then get into a, a kind of resilience rhetoric. And the problem occurs where employers and governments who fund healthcare systems step back and put this resilience challenge on the individual nurses. Um, that somehow they're the ones who are going to have to cope with the, the situation they didn't create, but they've tried to deal with. Um, and I think that speaks to a situation where it's a, about investment in the current workforce, which I, I think I said at the beginning of my presentation. We need to recognize that significant proportions of them um, are in a situation where they need respite or they need reduced workloads or reduced hours. And we therefore need to be looking at how we can enable that to happen so we can keep them for longer uh, overall, which is good for them and good for us. But we then need to be looking at how we can ensure that the numbers are being increased so we have scope to get into that kind of respite. Um, and I have really significant concerns for some countries about the the likely level of outflow of nurses over the next two or three years. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. I'll come back to you, Nicole, in a minute. I, I was just interested in uh, Professor Yazin and, and, and uh, Prof Gareth's opinion. Yeah, uh, Prof Yazin, you, you mentioned that you cancelled all the vacation leave during the pandemic. And so I suppose I, I should ask, did you give it them back? Uh, and, and what are uh, the other strategies that you might have in the kingdom? Thank you. So that happened during the first wave, which uh, lasted maybe um, maybe two to three months. So then things were, uh, the vacation were returned. I just want to um, comment um, on uh, how we all seen healthcare worker around the world were um, managing patients with COVID and during these multiple waves with the highest level of uh, professionalism and uh, commitment. And um, I think part of the issue of uh, burnout, how to, to prevent burnout is uh, related to leadership visibility, to show the staff that they are supported, supported by trying to keep their environment safe, by making uh, different uh, PPEs, for example, available. But I think the visibility of, this, of the leadership to the healthcare workers who are taking care of these patients is so essential. In addition to the different programs that were mentioned, psychological support, but very often, and uh, the, the appreciation of the uh, community, appreciation of the leadership is so important to the healthcare workers. Um, so this is my would be my take. I think many during the beginning of the pandemic, we've seen how people um, felt that the healthcare workers are heroes. But with time, with second and third waves, they um, start to become a normal business. Um, and but the challenges remain the same. 
In fact, for, for the ones who of us who are managing these waves, now we have the waves of COVID, but we waves of the non-COVID patients who are lagging behind from previous and now flooding our healthcare system. So the challenge is slightly different, but they are still there. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Gareth? Yeah, thanks, Jed. Um, yeah, I think uh, here in Peru, I mean, one of the things particularly around um, mental health and care uh, is, is come at, at a national level and similar to Tori's experience and um, explained to us in South Africa. I mean, what we have now is um, mandatory uh, workshops on stress in, in, in organizations. For example, in my university, we had a you know, managing stress workshop, which we've never had before, uh, because we're teaching online and different uh, things. And so there's a, I think there's a greater awareness across the community, across society uh, of this. Of course, healthcare workers here in Peru were probably the first to get really, you know, hard hit in terms of deaths. And over, over the first um, wave, you know, there was a lot of um, concern about that. But I think we become numbed to some of the concern and with the high numbers of uh, people, uh, you know, it, it goes by the by. Uh, and so, you know, constantly coming back and talking about that, um, and I've seen some of the comments there and I agree with them uh, in the chat. I mean, bringing it to mind uh, frequently so that we really understand the role and the importance of the health workers. And, you know, the pandemic really brought out, I think for many Peruvians is, is that, you know, the rates of pay and the conditions of these workers uh, that we're so much relying upon um, is relatively poor considering the, you know, the, the commitment and the, um, the risks that they took, particularly early in the pandemic here uh, in Peru with um, infrastructure problems. There's, there's also like social, I mean, here in Peru, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, like in most countries, there's this social cultural milieu that we have to deal with as well. And it creates, um, uh, you, know, um, um, you know, positions that people will take um, on particular things, and they may be quick to agree or less quick to agree, and things that will come in and cloud what's actually happening, like a government crisis, or we might see this thing with the Ukraine now coming in and causing, you know, the new crisis and taking away this longer term or medium term view of it. And so it can become quite difficult. Here in Peru, we've had uh, four presidents in uh, three years type of thing. And so we've had political uh, unrest uh, as well as social unrest uh, occurring as well. And it, it's, it's hard to focus on some of these issues that we're talking about and keep the focus on them. Uh, and I think that's a challenge as well, uh, to be overwhelmed by this constant wave of, um, of crisis. But you know, sticking to some things as well. And as I said, that I mean, the thing that, that, that I think helps is that the government having their uh, workshop to bring in a, a large number of people and look at these perspectives early towards the end of the pandemic to see if we can, you know, if we can crystallize that. I haven't seen the results of that yet. And I'm um, going to be talking to a couple of my um, friends in um, the ministry to see if we can see like what came out of that and if it's going to be different, if there has been a sea change or something that will um, move um, something in this way. Um, so, I mean, I just answered a question just to sort of maybe jump off to something else. I just answered a question about system thinking in the um, Q&A. I think this is an important thing for us as well. You know, if we're talking about one cycle here, considering the workforce, I mean, what are the interdependencies of that? I mean, what are the, the virtuous cycles we can get from those things as well that will help make something else in our workforce planning or in our health system uh, easier to achieve in the future as well? And so not just looking at things in silos or we need to help health workers is that, well, what's the implication of that? Will that it help attract more funding? Will that change the way health is delivered? You know, if it's not, um, maybe we look and say, well, we, maybe we should be sort of trying to leverage from some of these things, uh, you know, a deeper change rather than maybe a surface change uh, as well sort of comes up. So hopefully I'm sort of on topic. I don't know. Maybe I sort of fluffed around a little bit because it is it, it's something that's almost philosophical. Uh, 
as much as it is um, management, isn't it? Yeah, uh, thanks, Gareth. Appreciate it. I know Nicole wants to come back on the on the the, the health and wellbeing thing. Nicole. Yes, Sam, thank you. It was a point that Jim made about the resilience. So I was on a call last week and someone talked about the R word and I wasn't sure where it was going, but it was about resilience. And I think we just need to reframe what we mean by being resilient. In my head, resilient is knowing when to take a break as opposed to going until you break. That's how in a very simple mind like mine, I would define it. But some staff are getting a little bit annoyed when we say to them we need you need to build resilience is like a deficit model as opposed to kind of meeting people where they are so it's just I wanted to see if that negative connotation about resilience is creeping into any of the other regions that are, are represented here uh, okay th thank you um I uh okay so there's a couple of things really that are going around my brain and obviously the, the, the richness of the conversation and the questions here uh, is, is uh, make, makes it really quite difficult to extract everything we possibly can for, from you. So I uh, apologize from that. But um, so that what is clear, however, is there's lots of complexity in all of this. And uh, at the end of the day, the people on this call have a, a, at least a, a reasonable understanding of the subject matter. Uh, both as um, uh, leaders and decision um, um, makers, but also having exp being part of that uh, entire period uh, in history. But how do we make what's been said today uh, intelligible, uh, intelligible for stakeholders that are going to make differences in terms of uh, investment. Uh, and what I'm specifically talking about are politicians on one end, but also the general public understanding what the challenges are uh, uh, here. How do we uh, disseminate and communicate um, uh, the, 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 these challenges in a positive way to ensure that we get buy-in from public and politicians? Um, and I think I will turn to um, who can we go to first? Uh, Jim, go on. Would you like to start? Saving the easy questions to the end. Um, I think a starting point for me would be I, I think you framed it nicely because it's about politicians, policymakers, and, and the public uh, is to recognize that the, the narrative that plays out in those different worlds at the moment is mainly, if we look at health workforce, health and care workforce, it's a shortage narrative. Um, it's a burnout narrative. Um, and politicians and policymakers need to accept that, that is actually a fairly accurate narrative in most countries and not pretend it isn't. But then move beyond it to looking at what we need to do about that. And I think What's come through to me today in terms of the conversation is a recognition that uh, that it, there aren't and I haven't heard of any new solutions. You know, any ideas been tried already? Probably. What we need to be looking at is a sustained support to move to a situation where we're better prepared for the next global shock uh, in terms of the workforce, and that is. Um, a couple of other narratives. One is the investment narrative. So we need to get into a situation where funding for increased health workforce, enhanced health workforce, better located wealth, health workforce, better equipped health workforce um, is a positive. And it's about improving population health, but it's also about improving security. It's also about improving uh, economic well-being. And the evidence is there to support that. So it's harnessing that evidence to get the right arguments in place, but it's also recognizing that uh, evidence in itself doesn't change anything. It needs to be properly put together, properly managed, um, articulated. And this is where I think working uh, with uh, public, with civil society, with the media is so important because that is when we can move beyond the negative shortage narrative and get it into one about, this is what we need to do to get beyond shortage. And the reasons why we've got to do that are so critical uh, that the people you elect 
who then tell the policymakers what to do, need to get it, need to understand it, uh, that it's about people and money. Uh, and we need to be looking at both in terms of funding streams as, as we go forward. Thanks, Jim. Uh, somebody else want to come in there? I could um, perhaps reflect on our experience um, that we learned from MERS. Um, there are a couple of things that happened because of the MERS in Saudi Arabia. Uh, one is that many processes were placed, uh, were, were put in place, uh, lots of policies, etc. But the other part is related to, related to your question, which is the culture. There was um, the, the public culture and the leadership culture, non, the non-medical, not healthcare workers, was very primed uh, with the MERS um, outbreak that um, a new coronavirus coming, uh, it didn't take much for changes to happen, for resources to be mobilized. Uh, I think the culture and how we reach to reach that, that point is so important. And we've seen this, we were able to mobilize resources and get, um, get the support from different um, sectors easily because it was, uh, people knew what could happen. Um, that wasn't the case in the MERS in 2014, 2015. It took longer time because people were not aware of, of, of the consequences. And we've, we've seen this in countries that were um, not very well prepared. Uh, the performance in the response was, was slow. Thank you. Uh, Nicole. Yeah, I, I would say to politicians and policymakers is healthcare workers are people too. And sometimes I think uh, it seems to be forgotten that they treat healthcare workers as, as commodities uh, can just get more efficiency out of them. But actually they're, we're people and treat us well in terms of pay, terms and condition, the whole image, the whole way you speak about us Nurses are not angels and the angel came and gave me a cup of tea. We're human and we are going through a mourning. Someone put in a chat, we have a mourn for colleagues who've passed away because we're still on that conveyor belt of just autopilot. So treat us well, terms and conditions, pay, and we will be committed to stay and be role models to attract the next generation and to care for patients. But I think just recognizing that we have needs that are more than, than just a, a, a clap is uh, the long-term investment as opposed to short-term culture where we stop, we fill a gap, and we create a role for a year. You get someone in a very senior role, they do it for a year, the funding ends, they have to go back. It's demoralizing. It means the next time an opportunity comes up and people see what's happened to their colleague, they won't go for it. And we lose people who have that real rich, clinical background going further. So long-term strategy rather than just a short-term fill a gap. Thank, thank you. Sorry, I, I wonder if you uh, want to come in. Yeah, sure, just just uh, 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 briefly. Uh, um, off late, in fact, in the past uh, couple of weeks, uh, we've had, a, a, you know, um, uh, last week, actually, um, the, the, the minister in, 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 in Parliament, our health minister, was questioned around uh, having over 10,000 nursing vacancies, over 2,000, um, uh, 1.3 uh, doctor vacancies not being filled. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the response being that, you know, it's, it's an issue with uh, Treasury. Combined to that, you know, um, hearing that in, in one province, the 4,000 um, uh, staff appointed temporarily for the COVID relief are just suddenly being being um, uh, just uh, um, released just like that, you know. Um, and then having another story come on, come out of a hospital where senior doctors have, have had to pay, uh, uh, help support uh, 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 interns out of their own pockets because of delays in payroll. And it's 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 it's, it's you know um uh, and, and these have made top of the news and really kind of shown the light on you know 
this is how we're treating our 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 our, 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 our so-called heroes, you know. Um, so so you know um, it's 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 you know so, so, so and the government is under pressure to do a better job of 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 of, of, of car as Nicole says, um, it has an implication on attracting in, um, further workers. You know, how are we going to build a pipeline that we so de desperately need if we can't, you know, um, do well with, you know, what currently exists? Um, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, there is a national conversation happening. There is a, a, a light um, I'm showing on it, and you know, um, and hopefully we'll see meaningful um, prioritization by Treasury of. Oops, I think we may have lost Tori again. Gareth. Um, of of healthcare oh. workers and school, if I'm gone. Sorry, Tori, we're having difficulties with reception. Apologies. We just lost the last sentence there. Um, I, don't know, I don't know whether you, you, you just wanted to, to sum that up. Yeah, I was just saying that, you know, we are, you know, the, the issue of, um, um, you know, um, funding and treating healthcare workers is a national priority uh, and, and, and we'll carry, carry on being so for, for a while still um, yeah thank you gareth last word just just a quick one i mean one of the things that we have here in uh, latin america is uh, what's called the informal economy in a country like peru informality which is uh, uh businesses and and people operating that that maybe don't pay their fair share of taxes or don't pay taxes or avoid taxes or other levies. Uh, and this is reason why we're still at 20% away from total uh, universal coverage is because people aren't getting that worker coverage because they're working informally in these businesses. And so understanding the economic, the social construct of a country shows, you know, can explain a limitation that politicians have, but there's also the reason why informality is high here is because society condones it and so we have this interplay it's not necessarily politicians versus the the you know the voters we have this collusion around uh, uh you know the government not being able to raise perhaps sufficient funds if something was different and so i think we have to be realistic about you know the situation that we're in as well and perhaps um on uh sorry um governments are a little bit hamstrung in a way that they can't, maybe they want to do it, but maybe they don't have some of the resources as well. And so that's just a contra view there uh, that uh, perhaps uh, can be happening. Uh, but wholly, I agree with the sentiments that have come out here that, that we need to be thinking it, you know, a little bit more broadly about it um, as well. Thank you very much indeed. Um, unfortunately, and I say this with some sadness, we've reached the end of the seminar today. Um, which uh, for me has been uh, most enjoyable. In fact, I, I'd really not only like to uh, thank James, Tori, Yazin, Gareth and Nicole, but I'd genuinely like to take you home and have some conversation, some further conversations on this. So uh, really brilliant. And, and uh, obviously the uh, presentations in the chat uh, will, will be made of available to participants as well as the, uh, uh, well as the slides. And it, it really has, I guess, set the tone for our remaining uh, last two seminars. Um, I'd like to thank you all for uh, your patience, attendance, participation uh, and broadband um, and wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Uh, as I said, we will share this recordance, a recording with all participants and we will advertise our next and third seminar very shortly. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.